wanted to take you over here to the the good people at the Council on Foreign Relations. They have this nifty magazine. It's called Foreign Affairs. And if you uh, if you take a glance at just even the cover shots over a span of years, you might see agenda unfolding. Right, death from above. They talking talking drone technology. Are they worth it? I, I'm pretty sure they keep making them better and better. So I think they the answer is going to be yes. That was what They're, July 2013. July yeah, August this is uh, July August 2013 was that one. The next one is May or June May June because it's like a quarterly magazine. 2013, the rise of big data. Okay, so they got drones and big data. All right. The age of uncertainty. Ooh, mm. ooh, make people uncomfortable. Let's take away certainty. Do you, can you afford to cook food? Can you afford to buy eggs? Can you afford to travel? Oh, the age of uncertainty is coming at you. It's the centennial issue, by the way. They're they're saying after a hundred years, this is what they chose to put on the on the cover for y'all. It's a it's a foreign agency <laughs> that's here to destabilize America. This is not a good picture. But wait, there's more. Who's this guy? Xi Jinping? Hmm. They changed the format, too. All of a sudden, it's a glossy. This is a, ooh, look, it's glossy now. Ooh, oh, wow. Yeah. Man. Now, this is uh, yeah, December. Yeah. This is November, December 2022. That's just a couple months ago. Now, January, February 2023, the world Putin made. Now, if you look on this last cover, sorry, we missed it. It's, the it's, it's Russia doomed. It's Russia yeah. doomed, right? There's just a little foreshadowing. <laughs> so there's a narrative being unfolded for the past hundred years. It's called foreign affairs. And I've got many uh, specimens over here on the shelf going back to the 1950s. They're not, it's not new. It's not even news. These are just people telling you their plans and they happen to be in control. So not everything in here turns out to be true, but these are positioning papers. This is much like the economist. The economist is a bunch of positioning papers with a collective. There's no, there's never a single or named uh, author of those articles. It's a collective's positioning papers. It's propaganda since 1921. And this journal, Foreign Affairs, oh, you guys aren't even going to believe this. This used to be a journal run by Thorsten Veblen <laughs> called the Journal of Race Relations. Yep. I'm going to bring that up in the history blueprint yeah, for you. Here. Yeah, that's let's go to the brain. Let's just type in. Sort of like what the RAND Corporation also points out as far as policy positioning documents and stuff like that. It's just that these are published for the public. All right, Thorsten Veblen, he's in the technocracy, the Journal of Race Development. It turns into foreign affairs. So <clears throat> race development. Now, you know, they're going to say uh, this idea is, of race development, it's not racial. It's not about preservation of the favored races, even though that's who this dude hangs out with. And he was, uh, this Journal of Race Relations also is brought to us by people like G. Stanley Hall and the University of Leipzig training of the PhDs. So the Journal of Race Relations was a United States representation of this roundtable movement in bringing Prussian education system in here. And then they turned it into foreign affairs. So <clears throat> interesting history behind the publishers of this here magazine. Now I haven't read the future yet. They haven't sent me uh, the spring one, but, uh, this guy's the temporary boogeyman, and this guy is the long-term boogeyman. Yep. And both of them are used like uh, angles on a vice, right? It's squeezing. You got to have two pillars on the vice, right hand, left hand, Hegelian dialectic. And you got Russia and China, which have been built up over the past hundred years by these same industrialists who created foreign affairs in the Council on Foreign Relations. That's history. So when you see them both in play, they're squeezing America and they, they're squeezing America into a, a globalist society. That's the plan that they're enacting. What do you think, Tony? Yeah, hundred percent agree. Um, there's been a lot of talk this week and I'm sure we'll get to some more videos in regards to propping up China as the next boogeyman. While there's been a lot of escalation in regards to the Ukraine, Russia, really uh, NATO, Russia situation now. And it's one of those situations where a lot of people have been pointing out a potential multipolar alliance or multipolar world um but at this at this juncture especially with how much the council on foreign relations and the foreign affairs magazine has pointed out as sort of policy papers they're positioning china and america to sort of be you know the continuation of the next or of the cold war depending on what concludes if it ever concludes with the situation in russia and you know they build up china to be this technocracy haven and almost as a testing ground for technocracy 
which again is social engineering through technology, then the goal is, you know, how will they limit conflict, but create enough conflict to usher in the sort through a Hegelian sort of dialectic to usher in the worldview they want, which is an overarching technocracy for the entire world. So that's, that's the situation in which we currently find ourselves. And I think a lot of people, um, we haven't shown all the documents, but just how much investment has been in China since the Trilateral Commission by Western multinationals to build up their economy. Um, that just showcases to me that this is really an Anglo slash sort of um, uh, globalist project, Anglo-American globalist project, more so than it being a multipolar hedge against hegemony by Western influence. And so I know a lot of people will push back and say, no, 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 the boogeyman is artificial. Yes, it is. It's being artificially propped up by the military industrial complex. And but there are strings politics. on that puppet. And exactly. Can... Exactly. And I'm seeing the same strings who invested in China are the same ones that control much of the industry and commerce and logistics in America and in Europe. So I don't see as much as Whitney Webb has pointed out as well. I don't see this multipolar alliance, which people like to prop up as being a real thing as much as being a contrivance, part of the Hegelian dialectic to bring us into a new world order. Well, it looks like a real thing until you see all the strings and then you're like, oh, it's a puppet. Yes. So here's an example. I want to take you guys, let's get in the time machine. Boom. 1962. Now these are the people, if there's people that killed Kennedy, these would be like those, those people. They have this journal. An American Quarterly Review. They got one rider on horseback, so they're not Brokeback Mountain yet. Like the <laughs> Templars. The Templars have two men on horseback. They're Brokeback Mountain. This is April 1962. Let's go into the table of contents. The Guns of August. No, oh, no. The Guns of November. These three vital steps. Where's the table of contents? Citroen, Ad, GE, IBM. Oh, and James Bond that. and Dr. No, the Russian outpost where the spies are, they're working out at IBM over there in the uh, Soviet Union. It's one of those companies that just keeps on surviving. I also saw a Mercedes commercial yesterday, and they're like, for 110 years, Mercedes has been, I was like, what? 110 years? You guys are going to mm. advertise like that? <laughs> so the success of the Nazis is part of your new ad campaign, huh, Mercedes? Good. Well played. All right. Uh, April 1962, we got some McCloy. Right, so you got people who are in the events, yep. <laughs> in the milieu of the Kennedy assassination, writing articles, yes, uh, among others. But um, the couple that I wanted to attract your attention to here's Alan, Alan of... Dulles, Ed editorial advisory board, Alan W. Dulles, Melvin dude who sat on the Conan. Warren Commission after Kennedy killed him, John J. McCloy, the guy who sat in Hitler's box at the 1930 something Olympics, right? So these are the people who bring you this quarterly. Is Melvin Conant related to James Probably. Brian Conant? Because they have my Melvin Conant in there, and I'm just, anyways, good. The end of the monolith, world communism in 1962, polycentrism, right? So all these things that you see, you know, this uh, multipolar world, these ideas were around back then, yep. and they were being written about. And then there's another one in here that I thought was very juicy. This one's Britain, the six, and the world economy. Not America the six in the world economy, right? This is an American publication, but it has like this very British flavor, but they go through the trouble of not, uh, you know, spelling words with O-U-R, like favor and color and stuff. So they Americanize the spelling at least. And then here's one, the unused potential of the world court. Mm. John Foster Dulles wrote in 1957, there can never be a, in the long run a real peace unless there is justice and law. Peace is a coin which has two sides. One is the reunification of force. Renunciation. The other, renunciation. Oh, renunciation. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. it's my dyslexia That's and the right. other side is the uh is according of just is the according of justice world attention has for too long been directed to one face of the coin at the expense of the other so they're trying to balance out the world with mr dulles's so then that, that's sort of a euphemism for bringing in a sort of international law that's yeah. what he's alluding to there yeah and they write about it all the time whether it's him or bertrand russell or any of these other characters i mean birdie bert's not in the foreign affairs uh articles but uh he has many books which we've discussed here at length on the show yep. uh, but they all talk, say you can't have peace without world government and we're going to keep having world wars until you guys will get together with world government is what they're saying and, and until the un can like disarm everybody and have control over all the weapons we're going to have these wars so you guys better let the un take control and globalize everything acquiesce your rights slaves yeah well said i mean these poly, poly crises poly whatever you know setting up multipolar world this is all just part of the anything this, to get us off balance basically yeah, contradictory states in order to continually bring in um the potential for war the potential for destruction the potential for this side or the other thing so we 
move ever so slowly or ever more quickly, depending on the scenario, to what they envision, which is a, well, by their own admission, a new world order, which is, you know, actually Paul Joseph Watts had a really good short about that this week. What is the new world order? And it's like 54 seconds and just popped in. Like it's about technocracy. It's about complete control, not only of the financial markets, but of people's biology. I mean, it's about to complete and utter top-down control from a central source of essentially private banks and very powerful um, rich families that have had enormous amounts of wealth for a very long time. They're remaking the world in their image that are part of an oligarch or a collection of businesses and families that have been ruling for a very long time that we've detailed many times on this show. Now, before we end out this little mini segment that I just made up, uh, Tony, I got to have you take a look at this because I was looking into Thorsten Veblen. I wanted to double check. It's really called the Journal of Race Development. And it reads here, the Journal of Race Development was the first American academic journal of international relations. Well, that's pretty substantial, isn't it, Tony? Yep. That's oh, why yeah. foreign affairs would draw its lineage, its history and evolution from this, right? Yes. Yep. It was founded in 1910 by G. Stanley Hall. Er, record scratch. Party party stops. What? G. Stanley Hall? Who is that cat, <laughs> Tony? Do you, what, does he have any substantial role in the ultimate history lesson with John Taylor Gatto? He's like a... <laughs> freaking all-star <laughs> yeah he's a uh, that's an understatement to say the least let's get into a little I'm bit looking of him, yeah. So yeah, i'm gonna bring is, him up here in the history yeah, i was gonna say bring up let's show people Stan what he is interesting psychologist Stanley. um it's interesting when psychology mixes with education and what you get is a chimera oh yeah uh, they had a chimera back then <laughs> all right so here's how this chimera right. works everybody so you got g stanley hall now from recollection now i'm gonna pull up some references on this because i'll tell you right now that uh, chapter eight of Anthony Sutton's uh, Skull and Bones book that he wrote mm -hmm. in 2001. Yep. It was originally a pamphlet. Wait, it, was called, it was called How the Order Controls Education. Yeah, yeah. And in that pamphlet, How the Skull and Bones Order 322 Controls Education, G. Stanley Hall was the all star of that chapter. And G. Stanley Hall is the first American who gets trained in the Vontian Prussian PhD system and imports it to America. So uh, he's right there with the first people like D uh, Daniel Coit Gilman of Skull and Bones that were also involved in the Prussian education system and these PhD doctorates coming to America in the first place. This is where I was trying to get through to Dr. Shiva last week, because I'm like, bro, you got you got this PhD degree from MIT, and that's great. But do you understand the history and evolution of the PhD degree itself? Right. And it seemed like it was that point was kind of lost. But and let's the history not and evolution. Go ahead. Let's not forget Wilhelm Wundt. Like, so he was a protege of Wilhelm Wundt's psychological, physiological, psychological system. And Wilhelm Wundt's Wundt the father of psychology. If father of psychology, and I think there's a connection with him and um, Johann Pestalozzi, which would tie yes. it the whole way back to 18th century Illuminism yes. or perfectibilis. So now we're back to the Illuminati. So you can see a direct connection with the lineage of the development of these secular institutions. Uh, and higher forms of education. So I need the Paolo Leone book. Yeah, yeah. Basics I have it, education. I have it on my shelf if I can find it. And then I also need, where's my Sutton books? I got a Federal Reserve Sutton book over here. Oh, we're scrambling over here because this is... All right, so Vunt. First off, if you don't know who Wilhelm Vunt is or was, get yourself over to YouTube, search The Ultimate History Lesson with John Taylor Gatto, watch it on his page, watch it on my page, doesn't matter, same content. Wilhelm Wundt, uh, yeah, his right. his teachings in America or his teachings in Germany revolutionized education into schooling in America. So they took out the part where you actually learn stuff and they replaced it with a part of you need to be indoctrinated to be a servant of society, be a good soldier, get shot at and not run away. Okay, I, I found it <clears throat> until you get your copy. So if you can All put right. it on the I do have a uh, book cam. I just haven't <laughs> hooked it up. I could try to hook it up real quickly. Um, I actually do have it hooked up. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Um, I think the important thing to point out here, so it's called Basics in Education by Paolo Leone. The Leipzig Connection. And let's just real quickly, I want to see if I can get this on the screen so I get my thing set up. Here's the contents. But not too impressive, but I'll get into the specifics of some of these. Probably can't see it. It's all whited out. Uh, let me see if I can get that better. There we go. Now... I just want to open up to some, you'll get some of the subtitles of this. So it goes into a new domain, chapter one. Wilhelm, Wilhelm Maximilian Wundt was born in 1832 
in southern Germany. So it gets into who he is, his psychology, his psychological method. He talks about Hegel. And I have actually a bunch of stuff highlighted in this book. So I definitely went through it a long time ago. Well, I have a lot. Bunt, who was attempting, yeah. <laughs> Bunt, so this is on page four alone. Bunt, who was attempting to place his ideas within the mainstream of German scientism by redefining psychology as a physiological rather than a philosophical subject. So they're relating it to behaviorism. This would be the first sort of beginnings of the manifestation of behaviorism, which is then shown through the Prussian education system because about molding behaviors of soldiers that will go and willingly die in war. And it gets into how they did this, how he went into this. I mean, it goes on and on. Oh, I got you. I got the pickup. Oh, here, here. I, I Listen to this page. Go, go to page seven. I got it right here. Oh, you got it? Okay. I was just <laughs> like, I have this thing. Vunt asserted that, man, go ahead. Yeah, that's crazy. All right. Vunt, Wilhelm Vunt, father of psychology. Vunt made two major con contributions to the transformation of education in the West. The first was theoretical and will be taken up here. The second is addressed in the next chapter, the impress, right? That's how they impress this education or this schooling on people, right? That's interesting. Vunt asserted that man is devoid of spirit and self-determinism. Oh, this is where PhDs come from and people who get PhDs. Oh, this is what they think, huh? Well, this is interesting. It makes sense with CERN and biolabs and chimeras because they don't think that we are conscious human beings with souls. They, they think, oh, okay, they're like uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Oh, okay. Now we can understand. He set out to prove that man is the summation of his experiences, of the stimuli which intrude upon his consciousness and unconsciousness. In directing the work of his students, he focused their energies on minute or minute examinations, yeah, sensory perceptions, in an attempt to dissect and quantify every aspect of action and reaction. Oh, you mean you can't quantify the soul, so it's not in the equation, so it doesn't exist? Oh, that's interesting. This is the guy and who it, made up the education system. And if that you continue down, enjoy. Real quick, Go ahead. at the Sorry. bottom of that page seven, it, yeah. it just says here, I think this sort of hits home. It says, a, quote, a highly respected physiologist, Vunt established the new psychology as a study of the brain and the central nervous system. From Vunt's work, it was only a short step to the later redefinition of the meaning of education. Originally, education meant the drawing out of a person's innate talents and abilities by imparting the knowledge of languages, scientific reasoning, history, literature, rhetoric, etc., um, through which those abilities would flourish and serve. To the experimental psychologist, however, education became the process of exposing the student to quote-unquote meaningful experiences so as to ensure desired reactions and it goes into a quote by and then he's directly. and this is only on page eight of this book but yeah. the mind is the connection system of man and learning is the process of connecting right and this footnote a concept going back to the latin or the root of the word eductus or to bring out to lead forth i think uh, yeah it's educare is what it says there. educare yeah and then at the top of page nine it basically just says if one assumes as vaunted that there is nothing there to begin with but a body a brain in mm -hmm. a nervous system, then one must try to educate by inducing sensations in that nervous system, which becomes nothing more than what? Stimulus and response. You have it highlighted because he is a stimulus response mechanism. So Von's thesis essentially laid out the beginnings of behaviorism itself, which they applied literally to the entire school system. Right. So here's the cover, everybody. Basics in Education 1, The Leipzig Connection by Paolo Leone. This is page 9. Vont's thesis laid the philosophical basis for the principles of conditioning later developed by Pavlov, yep, yep. who studied physiology in Leipzig, where, where Vont's lab was, in 1884, five years after Vont had inaugurated his laboratory there. And that's where Stanley Hall, or right. I'm sorry, or Watson and Skinner yep. for lobotomies and electroconvulsive, all this stuff that happened through MK Ultra comes out of this dude. And Stanley back Hall was um, spent a brief time in Vunt's Leipzig laboratory in 1879, and he has a direct connection with William James, who's considered the father of modern psychology. Now we're moving closer that's at to Harvard. And that's so at Harvard, here's Princeton, obviously. here's Columbia. Here, uh, the these are the origins of conditioning, and the later work of behavior psychologists such as Watson, who received his PhD from Dewey at the University of Chicago in 1903, with a thesis entitled animal education <laughs> and skinner right so Christ. oh wait there's one more page here uh page 35 education is interested primarily in the general interrelation of man and his environment and all the changes which make possible a better adjustment of human nature to its surroundings 
This is also the view of Dewey and other Vuntians, that man is a social animal who must learn to adapt to his environment instead of learning how to ethically adapt the environment to suit his needs. Oh, that's interesting too. So I think there's one last, this is what would you call it, the money shot of the book, page 94. Yeah, Pestalozzi, yep, yep, yep. Because this is how it comes to America. And this that's is, also uh, the connection the Louis, with yeah. um, the, the Illuminati. The, the Illuminati back then. Yeah, Special yeah. mention should be made of the concept of educational reform per se, its leading exponents in Europe and the United States, especially Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi, this disciple of Rousseau and of the Swiss mystic radical and physiog physiognomist Johann Caspar Lavater, having, as Swiss leader of the Illuminati, first devised a workable system of public instruction for downtrodden children. This is where public schooling in America comes from. This experiment right here. Exactly not the right. not the one room schoolhouse, the public school system that everyone enjoyed in the 20th century. Now, there's a whole bunch of footnotes. This footnote for the Illuminati is uh, from a book called Educational Reformers, published in 1891. Just for you conspiracy theorists out there who think the Illuminati is just an Internet thing. Uh, long history. So my next point in this, let me bring to the table. I'm going to show you this book. Let's see. Is it too big? Too small? There we go. Fleshing out Skull and Bones. Investigations into, into America's Most Powerful Secret Society. It has uh, five or six co-authors. So Sutton, Milligan, Chaikin, Tarpley, Altman, and Bunch. Sutton's book, from which many of these passages are taken, is called America's Secret Establishment, an Introduction to the Order of Skull and Bones. And in this book, there is a chapter which Sutton, prior to publication of this book, published as this tiny little pamphlet called the, How the Order Controls Education. Three, two, two. Now, how the order the order is skull and bones, a secret society at Yale University, founded in 1832 uh, by some opium magnates, and it's a German secret society inserted into an uh, in Anglo-American uh, foothold in America. That being Yale. Now, I paid eighty dollars for this pamphlet to get this piece of information that I'm going to show you, but I'm also going to tell you you can find this whole pamphlet in this book that you can pick up for a lot less. All right. So uh, let's see. There are various uh, skull and bones memorandums. Now uh, there was a leaker that gave Anthony Sutton. Here's it. Here he is right here. Professor Sutton, former of uh, formerly, let me just read it. Anthony Sutton was a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford university from 1968 to 1973. And he got fired right when the trilateral commission was created. David Packard, of, who also later fired Steve Jobs, was a member of the Trilateral Commission. He was at the Hoover Institute. He fired Sutton because Sutton was doing work on the trilaterals. Makes a lot of sense. Hoover, uh, or rather Sutton, learned he the hard way. critical of it. And that's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't. He, he, they basically said, you can't print that. He is a former economics professor at California State University, Los Angeles. He's born in London in 1925 and educated at universities of London, Göttingen, and California. And he's got a whole bunch of books. Uh, Technological treason, technocracy, the diamond connection, woo, gold versus paper, Wall Street and the rise of Hitler, the war on gold, Wall Street and the rise, uh, the Bolshevik revolution, uh, wars and revolutions, the Wall Street and FDR, trilaterals over Washington, uh, his Soviet Union series, national suicide, military aid to the Soviet Union, introduction to the order, and how the order creates war and revolution. He has so, one in there you didn't mention energy and the created or energy that created crisis, too, yes. which is pretty interesting. Yeah. So very interesting author back in the day. He got his skull and bones information from Charlotte Iserbeet, whose dad was in the skull and bones. And when he passed away, she found his archives, didn't know what to do, called Sutton. He said, yes, please send them to me. And he wrote this book, America's Secret Establishment, which I believe was published in 2001. 2000, this is an updated reprint from Trine Day 2002. And thank you, Chris, for the book. And... See. various copyrights because he used parts of stuff that he wrote earlier in this book so so we'll check that out all right now in this pamphlet how the, how the order controls education you got the russell family that's this deal about uh slaves but that's not the part i'm looking for oh here's g stanley hall this is memorandum number four the Leipzig connection. And remember, this was not the reference for this book that we just read from. Okay. That reference came from another book. The link, oh, let me zoom it. Zoom it for zoom it zoom for you guys. 
I'm trying to keep it. Let's get these other books out from underneath. Give you guys good, stable presentation here. The link between German experimental psychology and the American educational system is through is through American psychologist G. Stanley Hall, which is the guy we were talking about over here in the brain, right back on this page right here. So that character is coming from this book right here. The Hall family is Scottish and English and goes back to the 1630s, but Hall was not a Yale graduate. And at first sight, there was no connection between Hall and the Skull and Bones because he wasn't a Yale graduate. And he wasn't He's officially and, right. He wasn't yeah. officially in the Skull and Bones. Fortunately, Hall was an egocentric and wrote two long, tedious autobiographies. And it lists his autobiographies. And then it talks about people he worked with. And then he went to Antioch College and he found himself under the wing of, of the order, of the Skull and Bones order. So he's doing some work for them. According to Hall's confessions, right? He, he left confessions just like Cecil Rose. He became tutor for the Seligman Banking family in New York and was contacted by James K. Hosmer, professor at Antioch College, Yellow Springs. That's where Dave Chappelle uh, lives and his mom taught at Yellow Springs, at, or his dad taught at Antioch College. Uh, there's another version. It goes through... And it traces while uh, in brief, while at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio, Hall came under the influence of four groups. Yeah, you can see Horace Mann there. He's a major influential letter D in American education. Sorry, is co-founder of Skull and Bones, Alfonso Taft. Hall knew uh, William Howard Taft, also a member of the order in 78, the future president and chief justice of the United States. Hall stayed four years. So he made a connection there. Now, look, they got an org chart here, dude. This is why Sutton's so awesome. From Hegel and Herbert, it goes to Voint. Yep. And then from Voint, it goes to Daniel Coit, Coit Gilman, uh, who's this Colin Bones guy. And then uh, he becomes president of Johns Hopkins University. Have you guys heard of them in the past three years? Anyone? Johns Hopkins was founded by Skull and Bones. Did you guys know that? Event 201, anyone? All right, anyway. Columbia University, formerly King's College, located in New York. John Dewey starts passing down PhDs. University of Chicago, John Dewey also over here. And then this is founded, uh, funded by Rockefeller Foundation, General Education Board, which is also Rockefeller Foundation and Carnegie Foundation, who, you know, if you watch this podcast, are internationalists openly declaring that they want to uh, discontinue America in favor of globalism. And if you go back real quick, yeah, it showed that um, in the middle section there. Yeah. Daniel Coit Gilman, the order, he becomes president of Johns Hopkins. He hires Hall. G. Stanley Hall and trains, and trains John, John Dewey. Dewey. Yeah, right. you can so this see is the, the influence. Continuity. Exactly. Right. Yep. Right. And so G. Stanley Hall directly got his PhD from Wilhelm Wundt. He's a trans American student That'd and he trained a bunch school. of them, but yeah. Wundt was, uh, G. Stanley Hall was one of the first class. Got it. All right. So the Americanization of Wilhelm Wundt. Now you guys know who G. Stanley Hall was. Let's learn just a little bit more. He, let's see. Uh, Hall paused while in england i'll bet he did and then he went to germany leipzig and to uh, wilhelm von he became the first of a dozen americans to receive a phd in psychology a new field under von von created a new field called psychology and it started issuing degrees this so is before think, william james everyone like I, I know they say william james is the founder of sort of modern psychology but that's not necessarily true. That's the American foreign, version. That's the this American is where James version. Gets this it from. is in Germany. Right. 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 Okay. So my point would be this. A lot of people were like, I need a degree to do stuff. Who gave Vunt a degree to create degrees? Like the, the dude figured something out, started issuing degrees. Now everyone like goes and dentures themselves for years for a half million dollars in debt to get some PhD degree and all these sort of things. Right. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm giving everyone in the audience, you have license to make your own degrees. These people, they're all about degrees. We're going to get to the Illuminati and their degrees in a second. <laughs> Seriously, because it's connected yeah, into this I whole school. Me, this, is, this is I it. I have to pull out my perfected field. Paul, <laughs> yeah, so he got his PhD. He's one of the first 12. And then uh, they go through some more about this. Here's uh, Kant popping up over here. Karl oh, Marx. Yeah. Here. Wilhelm Maximilian Wundt, 1832 to 1920. Professor of philosophy at the University of Leipzig. That's the Leipzig connection everybody can you, connection. can you make the leipzig connection that's the question was undoubtedly the major influence on g stanley hall modern education practice stems from hegelian social theory combined with the experimental psychology of wilhelm von oh it's not about learning huh 
It's about controlling us. Whereas Karl Marx and von Bismarck applied Hegelian theory to the political field, it was Wilhelm Wundt, influenced by Johann Herbert, who applied Hegel to education, which in turn was picked up by G. Stanley Hall and John Dewey and modern educational theorists in the United States. Everyone in the audience in the United States, you went through this system. This is good to know. The Illuminati order documents show that Raphael in the Illuminati is identified as the same Professor Carl Casimir Wundt. Oh my goodness, his daddy's the Illuminati. Can't make this up. This is this is Anthony Sutton. He's he's tight. Um, and this, it's yeah, referred. So, to, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to read this last mm -hmm. paragraph. This Wundtian view of the world was brought back from Leipzig to the United States by G. Stanley Hall and other Americans, and went through what is known. Uh, among psychologists as the Americanization of Wundt. That could have been our title tonight. If I'd have known this on Friday that we were going to do this, <laughs> we could have made that the title. But the title is always just to mislead the newbies. Title's, not <laughs> titles just, oh, we're over here doing stuff. So anyway, this is a really interesting, and it, you know, it keeps going. Here's Colonel House. Yeah, I mean, there's a yeah. lot in this pamphlet alone. So I got my 80 bucks worth out of this. But a couple years later, I discovered Oh, yeah, there's all the that and yeah. a whole lot more <laughs> in Sutton's actual book. Yep. And if I go in here, memorandum number, what was that, four? So here's the look, say, reading scam. Here's where they took and broke our reading system in the schools. And it's all skull and bones, people. That's why it's hilarious because people are like, oh, this is all conspiratorial. And these are drug I'm runners. Like, no, this is history. That's, these are drug this runners is... that, you know, um, devastated China. That devastated, devastated most of the world who are, you know, tightly controlled families making enormous amounts of wealth, abusing chartered corporations, so forth. I mean, you, you get this. It's the same oligarchical situation that we're dealing with today goes back in history and it's designed these supposedly public systems that we were all forced to go through, mainly, especially public education. And then they made it taboo to know about who made it. All yep. right. So in this book on page 101. I believe this is the chapter, Memorandum Order Number 7, The Order's Objectives for Education, how John Dewey relates to the order. Let's see. Oh, Memorandum Number 8 is a summary, and maybe that's what this was. Let's check. It began at Yale. Where's the... Oh, this was the... Number 4 was, number the four was the Leipzig, Leipzig Connection. connection yeah. Well, let's go back in time then. Number 2. I'd be surprised if it had a red tab on the page it's probably on this page anyway it's in here memory of daniel coit gilman the first president of johns hopkins university creative genius so the skull and bones guy creates right first president of johns hopkins is the skull and bones so it's people about are like social they're not engineering it's about social engineering. okay so now here's the here's a <clears throat> one of these uh moolah shots let me let me zoom it in for you g stanley hall he had a career at Johns Hopkins University working for the Skull and Bones guy, Daniel Co Coit Gilman. Between his career at Johns Hopkins and Clark University, he created 149 PhD doctorates, people who were awarded under his study, right? So he's, here's some other people and how many they were racking up. But the point about Skull and Bones creating this system and then racking people through it at these various universities gives them influence and control that can't be easily detected if you don't know they created that system and from where they got the ideas. And Rich, what is that system? The... What is that system? It's an artificial prestige system in order to build up a sense of artificial authority over the individual. Like that's the it's like the it's the instantiation of the ad barracundium or appeal to authority fallacy through social engineering. Now I'm looking for, and he's just brought up one of my favorite books, Critique and Crisis. Now this is a heady book. If you yeah. think you are a oh, nerdy yeah. mf'er and you know something about the Illuminati, then you pick yourself up this book because it goes, it goes pretty deep. I mean, I got other ones that are deeper, like uh... Terry Melanson's book is a really good general grammar sort of overview of the Illuminati. He goes into the this one's That's good, yeah, because this is the number two in the Illuminati. Yep, Baron von Knigge. His name is Philo. And he's having correspondence with Adam Weishaupt, uh, a.k.a. Spartacus. These are the letters. And this is like German museum you know, sources. Like the, the Illuminati existed. They had power and influence. They had systems. Now, are they still in control of those systems? No, I don't think so today. But do you not think the Council on Foreign Relations and these other groups don't pick up useful things that existed and maybe aren't being? It's, it's like if you took something that's out of copyright or a trademark or a logo that's no longer used and you start using it. 
because it works. They're not using it over there. Oh, we can't. Let's use the Land O'Lakes girl because they're not using her over there. Is she available? Because she brought like, you know, something to the package there. I'm just saying it's, it, it's in more these like situations. A- it, I'm not saying that because one of the big a historicities about the topic is like Myron Fagan's 1968 conspiracy Illuminati record or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And it had right. the CFR and the crosshairs on the front and it was mixing like it was tropizing Illuminati with C- CFR. Right. I'm not saying there's a connection. I'm saying there's a c- direct connection between the Illuminati, the people who created the PhD education system and that the CFR takes that and like uses it to help dismantle America. Yeah. Some of these conspiracy elements, what was the, the protocols of Zion? That's analogous to that where it's, you can you know, or Albert Pike's very world dude. war three letter. Sure. Yeah. That's another that, big one. You know, sort of stuff that 100%. doesn't have primary evidence. And I think to your point, I really, I want to bring this forward is that but that doesn't apply to anything I just showed you. There's primary evidence and artifacts for all the things I just showed you. It and, as, and as far as critique and crisis and Philo's reply and Terry Melanson's book of the perfected B-list, like the most important thing to understand is like, yes, the, the individual players are dead and those families may or may not have power anymore, but the philosophy, it's the philosophy, it's their ideals, their intentions, their beliefs and statecraft and uh, perfecting man in some capacity that like, you know, paid itself forward into what we now have with transhumanism, with well, the, this idea of a new world government, new world order. I think uh, it's like a, a Logan's run where they created an AI system. Like, like they had, The notion is this. I'm not saying this is what's going on. I'm saying this is what it's like. It's a metaphor or a simile. One of those two. You can pick it. They create an AI system that controls humanity. And then the people who created that die, but that AI keeps controlling humanity. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good. These people set up this system. They might've not left enough progeny to educatedly like propel it, but it's still going and it's still eating up raw materials and turning them into the thing because nobody's turned it off yet. I don't think it's our job to turn it off. I think it's our job to starve it out. Starve by showing people better options by showing you like, that's not education. That's conditioning. You're being indoctrinated. Here's how to do education. You don't need them. You have a variety of tools available, books, people in the internet. Like you can learn stuff without that over there. Oh, hundred percent. You don't need the artificial prestige and authority to bestow upon you the right to have knowledge yourself and to be able to actualize that knowledge and put it into practice and provide for yourself. What makes the Grand Theft World podcast unique, invigorating, exciting, and informative? Most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news. They're covering current events from the day they happen. And that is effective. It's useful. It's a great starting point. And then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story. So we like to give it a little time. You have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage. And the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history, we give you the source notes, the references, we do deep dives, and this really empowers you with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get into the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game. What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread, who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you said you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job 
So as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40 year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on.